We're now going to talk about the third of the four business government society models. This one is known as the countervailing forces model. So the countervailing forces model, I like to think of it as kind of like a story of a tug of war. Okay? You've got different groups of people pulling and pushing back on each other. And so while it might seem that at a given moment in time, one group has dominance, at a different moment in time, there's kind of a pull back, and those groups no longer have dominance over whoever was dominate, whoever they were dominating before. Okay? So it's kind of like a, a continual uh, series of tensions. Okay? Now the question is, tensions between whom? Which groups? Well, you first look at environmental capitalists. Okay, who would be envir Who would be some examples of environmental catalysts? Well, some of it might be um, things like, of course, the environment itself, as in nature, but it can also be things like the external environment. Think of markets, um, like the socio-political environment, so political systems, as we saw in the market capitalism model. Think of ideologies and movements. Again, that's part of the socio-political um, environment, as we talked about during the market capitalism model. Think of technology that's changing. Okay, that also sets kind of new background rules uh, for the game: war, terrorism. Um, Information technology, media. These are all examples of the environment. Okay. Then you've got, of course, the public. What is this public? Well, the public represents everything from society. It represents cultural values, public opinion, people who vote. Interest and lobbying groups, we'll talk a lot about that later. Um, demands of the market itself, different social classes, um, any sort of demographic changes. So society in a very broad sense. Okay. Then we've got, of course, business. So Business, of course, are oops, firms or profit-making activities. You've got uh, products and services. You've got public relations between firms. You've got different kinds of campaign donations coming from lobbying groups. We'll talk about that. Um, you know, executives performing public, private, and governmental service. Of course, you've also got uh, philanthropy. Okay? But generally speaking, if you remember nothing else, businesses as the profit-making activity. That's a different kind of countervailing force. And then, of course, you've got the government. Okay. The government includes the Constitution, it includes laws and statutes, it includes governmental bodies and agencies, political parties, political leaders, members of the judiciary. Okay. And of course, they're all kind of engaged on a tug of war with each other. Okay, it may seem that the government is suppressing the masses, but then all of a sudden there's a revolution, there's terrorism, and somehow society takes back some of that control from the government, okay, or from businesses. It may seem that the environment is pressing us down, and then someone from a business comes up with an invention to help us conquer the environment. So at any given time, it may seem that one group is dominant, but then they kind of pull back on it, and um, kind of an equilibrium or a type of balance is restored. 
Now, this model differs from the other four business and government societies because it allocates an explicit role to the environment. Okay? Uh, in the market capitalism model, the role of the environment, we'll talk more about this later uh, during this course, but the role of the environment is pretty much, well, if it's a free resource, we can take advantage of it. It's seen as, as a resource itself. The dominance model is somewhat muted. Uh, with the environmental forces, yeah, they set the rules of the game, but specifically how do we interact with the environment, it's somewhat muted. The stakeholder model does have um, some discussion of the environment, which we're going to talk about in a second, but it's more about balancing interests as opposed to being uh, an equal player. We'll talk about some more of the theories that go with the countervailing forces model uh, just a little bit later in this course. Now we're going to talk about another model that's almost identical to the countervailing forces model, but with a couple of exceptions. Okay? This is the stakeholder model. So what you do So in the stakeholder model, the corporation is at the center. Okay. And the corporation has what they have what they call uh, stakeholders. Okay? And who are stakeholders? Stakeholders are people that have uh, typically um, some sort of a direct influence or are directly influenced by the corporation okay now the degree of impact can vary okay the people that are most directly impacted are what we call primary stakeholders okay so there's no right or wrong answer to a primary stakeholder is of course so when you're actually working every company you'll find will have a different set of stakeholders these are just some examples Normally, we think about as primary stakeholders. Let's see if I can use some of these colorful pens. Okay. Normally, you look at employees. Hopefully, it shows up. Yeah, it looks like it. So, you've got employees. Okay. They're typically a primary stakeholder because you hire and fire employees and they work directly for you. Okay. You also got customers. Customers are the people that are voting for you, essentially. They vote with their wallets. Okay? They buy your products and services or they don't. You bend to their will or you don't. Okay? It's a direct influence. Okay? You also have stockholders. Stockholders are the owners of the firm itself. Okay? Now, I want you to pay attention to this. A stockholder is not the same thing as a stakeholder. Okay? All stockholders are stakeholders, but not all stakeholders are stockholders. Okay? Stockholders are the people that own parts of a firm through, for example, the purchasing of stock. Okay? And stockholders also have a direct impact on the corporation because they can vote, although we'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, one of our last lectures on corporate governance. But they can vote, they can affect the governance policies and the strategy of a corporation, and they can buy and sell shares depending on their assessment of profitability of a firm. So there's a direct relationship going on there too. Okay? You also have the government. Of course, the government is a primary stakeholder, someone with a, a, a direct impact or influence. Um, the government, these are the people, of course, they make laws, they impose rules on the corporation, and of course, they set the tax rates. And the corporation is required to bend, is required to pay taxes and follow the laws of government. So that's a direct impact. And then, of course, you have communities or our society. 
Okay? So community or society, think of, for example, the town where a corporation is headquartered. Okay? They would have certain obligations to those local communities. Sometimes that might be more to the local government, like paying taxes, but it might also be engaging in activities of corporate social responsibility, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about a little later in this course. One other one that I think is very important that you usually see in a stakeholder map are the suppliers. Okay. Suppliers are the ones who set the prices for the goods with which you will use to hopefully eventually assemble a product. And so your relationship with suppliers is also very important, a direct impact. Okay? So these people in blue are what we would call primary stakeholders. Okay? The corporation's actions have a direct and severe impact on the primary stakeholders, but also vice versa. Okay? Now we've got some other people. Okay? Let's set this right. and we call these people secondary stakeholders. Now, it's not showing up at all, I don't think. I'll have to put this on with the Sharpie. I apologize for the confusion. Okay. Now, secondary stakeholders are impacted by the corporation, but usually less so. And they can really be really anybody you can imagine. Um, some classic examples. How about um, labor unions? Okay. Their impact, you could argue, for some corporations is less direct than it is, for example, employees. You might have the media. The media would have some sort of an impact on a corporation, but probably less so than, for example, the government or stockholders, who might be some other examples. Um, the environment. Environment or nature. So you think about it, if a corporation refuses to respect the environment, like we'll talk about in a couple of chapters, at some point the environment would give out, and that would possibly harm the corporation, either by no longer supplying raw materials or um, uh, possibly pulling the government in to regulate that corporation that wasn't respecting the environment. And just kind of one more, um, perhaps the poor, that's also a good example. Especially the corporate social responsibility doctrine is generally saying that corporations have some degree of responsibility to the poor. Okay? You do not have to agree with the stakeholder model and any of these other models. We'll talk about some alternate models in class. However, my own experience has been that the stakeholder model is probably the most commonly used model that you will actually see doesn't mean it's right or wrong, it just seems to be the one that's the most commonly used. Now another important question. The countervailing forces model and the stakeholder model, they, they look kind of the same, don't they? So what's the difference? And as we progress in this course, you'll actually find that the majority of the theories that work for the stakeholder model, uh, excuse me, the countervailing forces model will also work for the stakeholder model, okay? But there's a subtle difference in kind of the ontology or the understanding of uh, reality. And namely, the difference is that under the countervailing forces model, it is assumed that all forces or actors are equal, and they're kind of there's kind of a tug of war. Nobody is dominant at any given time. Whereas in the stakeholder model, the corporation is at the center, and as an executive, what you need to do is kind of balance or manipulate your stakeholders to behave in such a way that is in your interest. Okay. Now, there's not necessarily any sort of implication of power here. Let me give you an example. 
you think about some smaller oil company. They might use, for example, a supplier like Halliburton. Okay? So your smaller oil company is here in the middle, but if they were to use Halliburton for their supplies, well, Halliburton is a major conglomerate. They're more powerful than many of the oil companies they supply. So actually, the supplier is much more powerful than the corporation, but the corporation needs to find some way to manipulate or indirectly control those stakeholders to their benefit. I hope this uh, definition or this kind of explanation makes sense. Of course, one of the main uh, criticisms of the stakeholder model is that how do you really define the stakeholder itself? And I would argue that the same can be allotted to the countervailing forces model. Well, who are these environmental, business, government, or public actors? It's not all that clear. And what I want you to remember is that it's all going to depend on where you're working. Okay? These are contextually defined, defined by the situation. Okay? So how do you define who is or is not a stakeholder? You could really put actually the whole breadbasket of the world's pity inside the stakeholder model. Okay? So, but again, that's kind of the part of management that's important, is understanding how to make choices. Okay. And the lights have gone out. This is why it's important to pay the utilities. So we'll go ahead and finish this video, and then I'll get the lights back on for the next video. Um, another thing that you have to look at with the... This seemed to help a little bit. Another thing that you have to look at with the stakeholder model is that stakeholder interests will vary, and they'll, by definition, be in conflict. Um, so there's not really any sort of clear resolution mechanism for stakeholders in conflict. And so that wraps up my discussion about the specific models. Our next video, we'll talk just a little bit more about how to use the models in general.